your, wor your words of wisdom will not be heard by the public. And I'm sure that would disappoint you as much as it would disappoint them. So microphone if you're going to say anything, but that isn't an indication to not say anything. Human Rights 101, which is also known for the purposes of, I hope, a vaguely funny introduction as .com and me, because I am, in fact, the same as Kim.com. Um, but I'll tell you why in a minute. Him and me will talk very briefly about what human rights are, but it's not a theoretical discussion. We'll go through, through some recent events in the history of internet human rights intercourse or interaction. Um, we'll talk a little bit about mega upload. Who here feels they know a bit about the mega upload case? Put your hands up. Good, because you'll all be doing the talking because I haven't reviewed it. Um, we'll talk a bit about access to the internet as a rights issue. Um, and we'll talk about some recent UN decisions, and I'll hopefully give you some questions to ponder. The more arguing you do, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Why am I and Kim.com the same person? Well, I'm not as tall as he is, or as big as he is yet, working on that one. Um, but see, the thing is, I reckon the FBI is going to come and get me sometime quite soon, and the reason for this is this. Who, I was uh, in the session just before with David Farrer, and he explained he tries twice to get content legally, and if he can't, he gets it illegally and uses it. I adopt a slightly different approach. I try once to get it legally. If I can't, I get it illegally. And then at some point in the future, when it becomes legally available, I buy it. So that's Game of Thrones. Now, accidentally, I had an episode of season two, Game of Thrones, that some evil person had downloaded for me and given to me. And I uploaded it into my Dropbox folder. It's in the cloud. They're going to get me. I deleted it. I'm sure it's still there. I just hope it isn't on one of his folders. But this guy is an interesting representation of a whole bundle of human rights issues that we'll try and unpick. This photo is Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the wife of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, instrumental in the start of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She was a strong supporter of rights. I'm just going to assert, because this isn't a debate about rights, that human rights are things, rights, freedoms to do things or to be left alone that we're entitled to by virtue of only one thing, which is our humanity. Um, and that's a reasonably straightforward definition. Does anyone have any violent disagreements with that? I think they've got a better definition of rights, human rights. No? That's good. Um, and. One of the questions to underpin this discussion is, do human rights matter on the internet? You know, are they relevant to the internet? Um, in the same way that are human rights relevant to the telephone network, or to buying some bread, or obtaining a t-shirt, or getting a tertiary education? Just think about whether they are relevant to the subject. Um, human rights and the internet have had a few recent collisions, mixings. Who remembers the debate about the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, ACTA? Who's heard of that? I've tried to avoid the acronyms. Some of you have. You need to get a bit more vigorous about putting your hands up, otherwise I have to look carefully at each of you. Um, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement wanted to increase the enforcement of intellectual property rights. And apparently, enforcing something differently has no impact on the rights involved, according to a senior government official I talked to at the time. So who thinks their rights wouldn't be impacted if the police started prosecuting every instance of jaywalking that they ever saw? Yeah. The enforcement of rights in a substantive way makes a difference to the effect of those impinging on people's lives. That is why the counter anti-counterfeiting trade agreement received such a negative response. Who remembers the blackout of the Section 92A fight in February 2009? Are oh, you getting a bit better with your hands? Good, good, good. Um, that was a reaction against an incredibly stupid piece of legislation that the last Labour government passed near the end of its term, which tried to say ISPs should have a policy of terminating the accounts of repeat infringers without saying what infringers were or what repeat was or what account meant or what suspension meant. Um, really capable lawmaking there, Labour. Good one. Um, so that does received a deserved attack and a repeal and a replacement years later with something else. Who has heard of the Arab Spring? Please put your hands up. That's, that's better. That's better. Uh, a a self-immolation experience in, was it Tunisia? Morocco. 
led to a whole outbreak, and a lot of which was organized illicitly and illicitly through social media. Um, the internet helped with those revolutions. Who remembers the UK riots shortly afterwards? Yeah. What was the weird thing that reacts to the internet that was mentioned by some people after that? Who's got a hand in the air for that? Yeah, Don, you need a microphone though before you're allowed to talk. You need a microphone before you're allowed to talk. Otherwise, people on the stream can't hear you. Uh, did they want control over the BlackBerry network or something? Mm, they wanted to shut down the BlackBerry messenger network because, oh no, people could communicate on it and the police wouldn't be able to see what they were saying. Outrageous. How dare they? Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPPA. Who's heard of that? Yep, that's been a long time in the coming, but it looks like it's going to try and go beyond what ACTA originally tried to do before it got watered down and watered down and watered down into the sadly broken piece of attempt to control us all that it is today, which still got it rejected by the European Parliament. There's a lot more to say about TPPA, so we're not going to go on about it. SOPA and PIPA, sort of that. The Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect Intellectual Property Act, something like that. Uh, massive demonstrations, fights across the United States. And of course, we've got the mega upload case. What links all of these, I think, is that the internet is involved. Uh, and people had a sense, rightly or wrongly, that their rights were under attack. Um, you know, that's, that's a debatable proposition, but it was certainly there in the public debates at the time. Yep, you want a microphone? <clears throat> Sorry, just in case anyone's missed it, the new WIPO um, Hollywood protection stuff as well is worth looking at. The which one? Oh, so, some, so basically some new additions to WIPO, um, which has been around for a long time. But um, a whole uh, Hollywood all got together and said, well, actually, we don't like the way that our images are being mispresented. It's basically the Streisand effect on steroids. Um, but they've introduced new stuff into WIPO to protect the um, images of and use of, you know, of, um, of Hollywood um, people. So, yeah, interesting stuff happening there too. Same problem. Great. Yeah, it keeps on coming in every direction. And there's another one as well, which is slightly related, which is that the International Telecommunications Union has got a massive conference in December this year, somewhere in the Middle East, where it's going to talk about the international telecommunications regulations. And some people are arguing that that is yet another forum where people's rights online are going to be attacked. So my point in this list is that there is a list it isn't a one-off, it isn't a single debate, it isn't one that's just started around mega upload. The human rights and the internet dialogue is an important one. There's even a global NGO that deals with it. Joy Lidica, do you want to stand up? Joy is from the Association of uh, uh, Progressive Communications, which is a global NGO that argues that access to the internet ought to be becoming a right. Is that fair enough? Oh, she'll, she'll explain properly later. So this is a big deal. Mega Upload, this is a kind of dreadful photo of them standing behind what are obviously bullet shields in case the FBI tries to shoot them in the Auckland District Court uh, or North Shore District Court, whichever one it was they were in. Um, so what happened with Mega Upload? The guy was running a service which allowed people to store files on the internet and access them as they chose and to share with other people uh, URLs that would let them get access to files that they chose to make public. And the scale of the copyright infringing that was going on on the mega upload service is alleged to be of an order that said that to the FBI and the American authorities, we got to get this guy into criminal uh, copyright infringement. Uh, and thus, in the court, after a swoop and some awesome photos of helicopters and mansions and tow trucks, I had a really nice picture of like a black helicopter and some tow trucks ready to tow his cars away, but um, I thought the shiny screens were more fun. Um, what are the implications there? You know, and that's what I want you to tease out. I'm not a human rights expert. I know there are some in the room who are. But think about the impact on Kim.com's rights of being a businessman, running what he thought was a lawful service, plucked out of his mansion, you know, taken into the court on the instructions of the American authorities while he's in New Zealand. All of the gear was seized. The service isn't available. What about the rights of the hundreds of thousands or however many, I don't know how many customers he had, of innocent users whose intellectual property 
was taken away, access was removed if they only stored it on the servers. You know, their right to access and express themselves through this particular service was immediately denied them with no notice uh, and apparently with no reparation. I don't think anyone's managed to get access to their upload data. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, there are arguments now in the court about the process that was used, um, and I'm glad David Harvey's running another session, so he can't uh, argue with me on that, which is a very high-level take on it. But it begins to look like the, you know, the whole process is being unwound, is being delayed. It's not delayed till April next year or August? March, March next year. Um, there's the privacy. I think this throws into light some privacy issues as well, which is, you know, if you're using a file sharing, uh, a file storage service, which may incidentally allow you to share files, um, who is looking at what you're storing? You know, what do the terms and conditions that Mega Upload used to impose say about copyright infringement? What rights do they give United States government agencies to snoop on what you were doing, given any connections between the United States and the service? Um, what rights do US government agencies have under US law to snoop anywhere they like on the internet, to monitor what you or I or anyone else does? And there will be other rights implications. Does anyone want to sort of pick up some that I've missed or suggest any other rights issues that arise so far from the mega upload case. Microphone over here. <clears throat> uh, issues of sovereignty and nationhood. Sovereignty and nationhood, I'm, I'm not convinced they're human rights, but they are, they're a set of issues that are definitely raised. Well, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came about after effectively what was geopolitical divisions after World War II. So I don't think you can actually detach if you're going to use the Declaration of Human Rights as a, as a core sort of symbol in this talk. You can't detach that from issues of sovereignty and nationhood. But you can't detach them because sovereign states are where they are enforced. That's, that's a good point. Anyone else? Joy over here. Just to pick up on that point, I think Joel's right in that um, uh, the rights by which um, uh, the actions of Kim.com or anybody else who's storing data um, uh, are assessed are not going to be the New are not going to be New Zealand laws. I think that's the point, um, and that our sovereign right to determine for ourselves what standards should apply are, are under threat because the cloud doesn't exist. Um, in fact, all information is stored on a tangible physical server somewhere, uh, and in, the, in that particular case, um, subject to laws outside New Zealand. I think that's the right point. Yeah. Uh, the microphone there. And just, I, I guess, building on that, um, where... Uh, so, so jurisdiction is, is absolutely vital in this because just because one country decides that something is, um, is illegal or, or that they can bypass the, a, a judicial process in order to do something or to enforce their standard, um, the, the issue of jurisdiction becomes particularly problematic when it might um, be based on evidence that is uh, in, I, in the cloud or is routed through a different country or um, where, where neither the supposed alleged crime or whatever is happening anywhere near um, infrastructure or, or communications through the, the country that they're trying to provoke. So I, I think jurisdiction does play a, a part as well. And I think you've got to add to jurisdiction the issue of power because try and reverse the case. Imagine that, you know, Bikurunga has announced a, released a new CD but there are some copies of it on a file sharing service that's based and hosted in the United States with the person being a Kiwi entrepreneur there. Can you imagine the New Zealand police Blackhawk helicopters flying into LA and plucking the guy out and demanding that the American courts deal with him and extradite him to New Zealand? If you can imagine that, you've got a good imagination. I can't, and that's because in our system at the moment, the United States is a powerful country and New Zealand is not. So these things, these rights are shaped and influenced at least a little bit by political power. We have a gentleman over here and then here and then Don. Um, another point of human rights is you know, appropriate use of force. I mean, they just went way, way over the top. And that's got to be an abuse of human rights. And um, also the assumption of innocence. I mean, if he's innocent, 
which we should assume until it's been proven so in court, he should be able to carry on his business. And they've basically ruined a multi-million dollar business. And you also need to look at the wide implications. They're basically, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars of damage has been done to the whole, you know, cloud business in general across all the... I mean, the, straight after we make it upload, was shut down. A whole bunch of other ones shut down without even any sort of police government force, just because they went, OK, we're freaked out. We're going to just close our doors now. Yeah, this is what happens to us. Ouch. Uh, one, one more behind you over here. Um, well, I, I'm wary of saying this, but I, I guess some people might think that possibly copyright holders and artists' rights play some role in, in this case. Mm -hmm. Yep. But, um, I definitely categorize those as economic rights, not human rights. Um, as, and there, there is definitely a substantial difference. I'm pretty confident that copyright isn't in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I stand to be correct. Um, Don. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just think we have to be a little bit careful about the um, jurisdictional issues. I mean, New Zealand negotiates extra, extradition treaties with other countries. We're in total control over those negotiations. Uh, I think we do expect, actually, US police to, if we've released an extradition uh, request, to go in and um, arrest uh, people on our say-so. So, you know, obviously, um, I do understand the mega upload case, but I think, you know, we have to avoid sort of uh, jumping to all sorts of conclusions about how international law works, you know, if, if a child's been abduct, abducted overseas, then <clears throat> I can almost guarantee that the p police will be in there, probably with machine guns if it's in the US, uh, you know, extracting the, the recalcitrant Kiwi to send them back. So, yeah. I think. The Trade Minister made a same, similar point in the paper on the weekend about the fact that a trade agreement does necessitate giving up some sovereignty and pulling it in a wider setting. Yeah, I, it's a good point. Yeah, I mean, we only extradite people for legal situations that we think are covered by our own laws. You know, it's not... We, we don't agree to every law that uh, is uh, passed in the countries that we have extradition agreements with. Joy, you were putting your hand up in response to that. Do you want to get a mic? Thanks. A couple of points. One is, I think, definitely in response to the person who made the comment about copyright holders agree, um, many of the people who were users of Mega Upload were content creators. Um, and they are disproportionately affected like other innocent users because they were using it lawfully and now the entire site's been frozen. So nobody can get access to even their lawful content. I think that's the, that's the concern. And in terms of extradition, Don, I would, I would agree with that point, but also just point to the anomaly of trying to extradite war criminals in countries or trying to extradite people for, for, um, for you know, violent crimes, which becomes problematic. And I suppose I just question the um, priorities of our government and other governments which are agreeing to extradite people for... Um, acts which I think are, not, are non violent, uh, predominantly victimless. Um, and if you look at, for example, in the UK, a 24 year old being ex uh, subject to extradition and, and penalties for up to 10 years imprisonment, I think that's the anomaly that I would, that I would raise. Thanks, Joy. One very quick point, then we'll move on to the next case. So it's just a very quick one. At the conference last year, I've actually just tweeted a link to a post about it, but um, um, the, the, there was the EG8, which was like the um, looking at the internet in the weekend before the big G8 meeting of the time. And, um, and they had this whole weekend looking at issues of the internet and what it means for all of us. And the top priority, right, that they came out with, the top priority in this space was copyright. Um, and it was just like, really, <laughs> all of the things that are happening, all of the, uh, I agree with you, like all, the, there's violent crimes out there happening and all these, there's many, many issues in the world and the top issue they came out with from the EGO was copyright. And that, I think, to me, implies the, the, the um, imbalance in, in um, priorities that's happening at the moment. Thank you. Right. If, yep. Jordan, if I could just, uh, just mention one thing. Um, we're talking, obviously, about human rights, but one of the things we need to probably be thinking about is what do we mean by that um, in terms of, you know, in the US there's a move to, to recognise corporations as sort of having sort of uh, 
rights uh, under the US Constitution. And I guess one of the things we're thinking, we need to think about is um, you know, who, has, who, um, who has priority in rights, because we're looking at um, you know, customer rights uh, arguably have been taken away, property rights in the mega upload case, um, in favour of uh, you know, Hollywood corporations. Um, and one, I guess one of the issues around human rights is who actually has these rights? You know, can corporations have these rights? Because um, it seems to me that part of the issue with the, the mega upload case that people have some issues with is um, it seems like people's own right to property has been, uh, has been lost in favour of these, these other organisations, the, the Hollywood uh, you know, studios who uh, are claiming, uh, trying to enforce their, their intellectual property rights. I think your comment gives a, a really good lens into the complex array of rights that do exist in the modern society. There's the human rights framework, there's the legal rights we give to corporations, there are economic rights like copyright and so on. I want to move on to the next case if I can, or is there something you want to say about um, Mega Upload? Oh, I, was I was going to suggest a positive I'd I'd alternative that could have perhaps happened instead. If, you know, if our government has stood up for you know, Kim.com and other such businesses, perhaps we could be you know, like the Switzerland of the 21st century and, and we'll have you know, um, tech entrepreneurs coming to New Zealand because they'll know they'll be able to be you know, safe you know, and then they actually you know, stand up for you know, whatever online business until they've actually fully gone through the whole process. You know, and we'll be like the Switzerland they've done for banking. You know, you go to your bank in Switzerland because you know they'll actually like stand up for your banking here. Maybe we could have been the same if, you know, if uh, people had sort of come to a comment. But, nah. well, so, something to think about is what's the difference between being the um, Switzerland of banking and what's the Bahamas of tax. So, you know, there's a, you know, one is a sound, secret, well regulated country, the other place is a tax haven. So. You know, freedom to innovate versus copyright piracy haven would be the other side of that suggestion. Yes, you, sir. So just looking at mega upload, right? mm. if we're going to look at um, uh, Kim's rights, right? human rights, right? surely the biggest issue there is not what's happened, what's been done, et cetera, et cetera, but the fact that his assets, his personal assets, have been seized to put him in a position where he actually can't stand up and defend himself through due process. And that so, was... so that's to me is the biggest human right. right? So he's been, he's had his assets seized, and there's a law in New Zealand that allows the police to seize their assets uh, when the assets are proven proven to be gained through crime. It's mainly been used against um, uh, drug dealers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the past. Right? But they've appear, I'm not a lawyer, they appear to have used that act right, to seize his assets, so he can't actually now stand up and defend himself. Now, that, to me, is a big problem, a human rights problem, as opposed to a legal problem or anything else. Thank you. That's a, that's a good point. I'm going to just take one more comment from this gentleman here, and then we'll move on to the next case. You've got to use the microphone. Thanks. I was just going to say, if anyone um, wants to help with note-taking, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> it's important, and it is related, because what we want is for the, the discussion to float out from here. Right. There'll be time at the end to come back to things. There's another really horrible graphic. Um, which is about access to the internet, ultra-fast internet. It's, <laughs> do computers vaporize themselves? Um, think about access to the internet. Who here has access to the internet day to day? Put your hands up. That's reassuring. Um, what are some of the issues that might affect access to the internet? There's the cost. There's whether it's available. We've got an interesting situation emerging in New Zealand where the government has mandated that three quarters of the population is going to get fiber optic broadband, fiber to the home, and it's mandated that um, rural areas, or some of them, are going to get 2.5 megabits per second if they're lucky through wireless and, and copper and so on in the rural broadband initiative. You know, whether creating a, a divide like that is a, a rights issue is something to consider. Um, there's the, the sort of degree to which access to the internet these days is important in exercising other rights, especially free speech rights. And I want you to think about that as we, we come along later on. Um, and there are the copyright things like the pictures that I have been using in this presentation. I regret to say I haven't sought permission from the authors uh, for them. Um, I did attribute them at least. They're a little, you know, you can see where the source is. 
um, but I should have gone to them as a, you know, but most people don't do that. Most people want to remix pop culture and use things that they find uh, to make a point. Um, I don't think this is as interesting as the, the mega upload case, to be honest, but there have been some recent UN decisions that relate to it. Frank Delarue was appointed a special rapporteur on internet and human rights, Joy, I think. No, what was his topic? Is there a microphone? Sorry, uh, Frank Larue is the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and the internet, right. and he sorry on freedom of expression and he, his annual report last year focused on the internet and it followed his assessment of uh, the treatment of bloggers and journalists who were being harassed and detained and in some cases executed in countries and this forced him to look at the internet um, and specifically issues in relation to freedom of expression online. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, and. Um, the Human Rights Council last week, on the 5th of July, passed a resolution which I'll just highlight a couple of bits of, um, affirming that people have the same rights offline as they do online, and in particular, freedom of expression, which is a right regardless of frontiers and through any media that we choose. And the UN Human Rights Council also recognized the global and open nature of the internet as a driving force in accelerating progress towards development. And it called on states to promote and facilitate access to the internet, um, which I think is just an example that the internet is becoming a platform that is more and more important in the exercise of some of the human rights and democratic and civic rights that we have in a way that maybe when the people who wrote it thought that, uh, thought that they were developing a system, they didn't really anticipate that. John, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Jordan. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that um, there is a real debate raging now on whether access to the internet can be described as, or should be described as a human right. And on the one hand, you have people who say, what are you talking about? There's not even a human right to have access to, free, uh, to clean water. And, you know, it's um, hard to argue against that kind of proposition. But I think that's to oversimplify, and it's, it's not an appropriate analogy. I think we are increasingly getting to a point where access to this technology, to the internet, is a precondition of effective expression of other fundamental human rights that are preserved in the international and domestic instruments. Great, thanks, John. Um, so, without dwelling too much on that, and just opening up to a few more comments, because we've got two minutes left. Um, where online are your rights at risk? Is the internet a place where rights matter? My view is that the answer to that is yes. Um, and who and what challenges them online. Yeah. So just invite any last comments or interventions. Hopefully you've been thinking about rights. Hopefully anyone who hasn't had anything to say yet, but if not, you, yeah. Well, so lack of people raise their hands. I thought I'd just say I oppose generally the concept of human rights when it comes to you know having internet access. I mean, why are we going to like have us make a human right that we should all have a cow? I mean, it, it's, I mean, like the internet, tonight, like, and I wouldn't even say clean water is a human right, but, you know, when we haven't got to that point, it's just, yeah, stretching. I mean, I support things like free speech, mm. but, you know, that's if you've got your internet access and it's your internet access you're using and you can say what you like, but it's a different thing. The you question, know, one of the interesting too. questions about that idea is who would pay for it if we made everyone have it? Yeah. There's a Finnish example, which is 2009, I think, where they said that it had to be a right to make available internet access. So the right you had as a citizen was to be able to buy it if you chose to, which seems to me to be a sensible place to start if you wanted to go down the rights track. Steph Thompson had her hand up in the back. Um, two things. I know that there's a session going on next door about regulating online, um, bad behaviour online, but I think and it sort of strikes me as quite unusual that we'd have t the two topics being diverged because, for me, you can't have rights without having responsibilities as well. And one of the things that sort of comes up here in terms of the concept of human rights is, um, yes, we talk about having all these rights, but citizens also need to be able to, educa to be educated about how to exercise those rights. And it's something that, Particularly because I work in a school, there's a lot of talk about cyber safety, but not very much on cyber citizenship. So perhaps another question should be, what is an effective online citizen? What are the attributes? What are the judgments? What are the behaviours? 
I, I completely disagree that human rights are dependent on human obligations. I think they come of themselves. I think a lot of other rights are like that. This gentleman over here. I, I think there's a, a wider debate happening, which I think that um, Joseph Stiglitz has brought up in a recent book on the price of um, inequality. And, and, and it's really, it's, there's a pragmatism required here. Rights are, in quotes, an idealistic idea for the disempowered. Um, pragmatism, perhaps, is what's best for the wider society. And, and, and there are many different, this rights debate is almost intrinsic within our culture and on many different fronts. But I think that the pragmatism of it is, is, a, is a, a fundamental issue. And this, the whole, what he was really contending in his recent book was that when rights and access is abused, then there's a wider cultural consequence which is not in the interest of our society. So we need to, I think, I mean, it is difficult when so much is happening to say, yes, but there's a bigger picture, bigger picture. But I think in this case, there is a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we know how to get through it yet, but there's a bigger picture. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, you over here. Um, people seem to forget that the internet has an ignore button. They do. You can ban people, you can ignore them, you can unfriend them. Um, just going back to the bad behavior thing is that you can't just go and say, oh, it's now illegal to troll someone on the internet because, well, that brings up the whole free speech issue and people forget that you can just ignore someone. You should pay attention to the Law Commission's work on uh, the subset of the new media, news media stuff they're looking into, which is dealing with harmful behavior online. Keep an eye on that. Um, yep, die, and then, yeah, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you. Um, kia ora, Di Daniels from Computers and Homes. Some of us have just come out, you know, quite hot from the um, rural broadband <laughs> session, um, where I'm just taking it back to the, the idea of, of access to the internet as being a human right. Um, and I think it's a bit of a red herring to say, well, access to water, yes, when nobody's debating that. But um, with government putting more and more information online, um, I think that you have to look at it within the context of the country. And within our country, we seem to have a basic agreement that access to education is one of the human rights of our citizens and access to information. And if more and more education and information is going online and people can't access it, <clears throat> then I think that is an issue. Um, one of the things that was raised in the last session was um, the TSO, the Telecommunication Services Obligation, um, where there seemed to be a presumption that there was already, that that obligation had already been fulfilled for telephone services to be accessed, you know, available to everybody. So um, we're still even one step behind that because there are a lot of places where there isn't even telephone access or it's priced out of, out of people's hands. Yeah. So just kind of wanting to bring it back to the issue of human rights and, um, and um, access. Yeah. Thanks. Kia ora. Hi. Last intervention over here. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Pia. I didn't do that the last two times. <laughs> um, as a pragmatic techie geek, um, I'd like to just throw into the... Um, mix that um, we can banter and talk about and, and debate about rights all we like, but um, it's where the implementation happens that um, it actually dictates our freedom. So our, our freedoms are basically reliant upon the technologies that we use. And um, so trying to come at it from, well, what freedoms do we want is, is a good start, but we have to figure out how that translates into the technologies that we use. So what I'd like to suggest is that um, it would be really good uh, to start to get some definitions around what are the um, technical and social characteristics that make the internet the social and economic, but the social powerhouse that it is, and let's um, and embed some of and, and if we get the if we get the technical protections right, then that will actually protect our freedoms better anyway. But if we just talk about freedoms, and you know, and lots of people have created online bills of rights and all those kinds of things, but um, how it actually is implemented is um, is is the important bit. Also, there's something happening tomorrow. What do you yeah, do you want to just mention that? Joy? There's a session tomorrow um, on access and human rights. Please do come to it, and you can continue the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you all for this discussion. Thank you for interventions. I'm sorry for anyone who didn't get the chance to speak on it. Go um, to the session tomorrow. I'm handing over to John Edwards. Cheers.